So when a business gives to a nonprofit, they're immediately expanding the scope in which they are driving impact. They may invest in solar panels or clean up their supply chain. And that's awesome. And that's all within the market. And we need every business to do that. And we also need and want businesses to step outside of that space to drive even more change through this nonprofit sector that's operating where there is no market. And as an added bonus, they get the ability to really deepen their connection with customers because of the stories of that on the ground impact. What's up, everyone? I'm Chris Ronzio, founder and CEO of Trainual, and this is Organized Chaos. As always, we're taking a page from a different leader's playbook so you can put it in yours as you build your own. And you just heard from Kate Williams. This episode's all about the importance of philanthropic alignment with your customers. Now, Kate is the CEO of 1% for the Planet, which is a global movement that ex- inspires action and commitment so that our planet and future generations thrive. Kate's led significant growth in this community's scale and impact, as well as some deep work on best practices for implementing these high impact growth strategies, growing a network brand and operating as a thriving workplace in an incredible team. So I loved this episode because frankly, it's different from any episode we've ever done here on Organized Chaos. And it's talking about how we can use what we do for work to drive impact in the world. And so whether you are wanting to make an impact in the environment, environment or some other cause that's near and dear to your heart, Kate walks us through their framework for how to pick a cause, for how to build it into your operational model, how to do it consistently over time, and how to get ROI from it so that you can actually market what you're doing and get more customers attracted to your business as a result. So enjoy this story from Kate Williams with 1% for the planet and all of the giving and ideas that come with it. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Organized Chaos. I'm your host, Chris Ronzio, and today we're here with Kate Williams. Kate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, I'm psyched to be here. Thanks for coming on. So before we get into everything amazing that you do in your organization, I wanna start with a little background question because a lot of people get into a career that just they're not really passionate about. And it seems like you've gotten yourself into a organization and a career that really aligns with your passions. And maybe it started from a young age. So I'm curious, how did you realize you had a passion for the outdoors? And what did you do to kind of intersect with that? Well, I was kind of fortunate. I did have an aha moment, which I know sounds cliche, but I actually did. I was um, on a backpacking trip when I was 18 in the big mountains in Wyoming and through, you know, went through some sort of challenges, including sto- snow, uh, missed re-ration for food, broken leg, all that kind of, you know, exciting stuff, which for many people would be like, well, that sounds like a horrible trip. And it was super hard work. And I was like called on to do more than I thought I could. But in the end, I remember watching the helicopter sort of taking our injured instructor away and having this, like I was exhausted, I was tired, I was hungry, my feet were wet. And I was just like, I love this. This is what I want to do. And I didn't know exactly what I meant by this, but it was like a combination of being in this incredible, beautiful, wild place and being called on to do more than I thought I could do and doing that with a group of people. And so I really have been trying to figure out what this is for my whole career um, in terms of both that environment and sort of leadership people space. So your instructor broke their leg and got carried yes. away and you had to just kind of fend for yourself or did the helicopter take you as well? <laughs> yeah, I kind of glossed over that. I mean, it is a, uh, you know, it is a story, but basically we had, we were about 30 miles from the nearest roadhead and this was before kind of cell phones and, you know, easy access to services. So, you know, we had a pretty organized um, runner team went out. And as an 18 year old, I found myself in the circumstances being asked to lead the remaining students to the pass where would we would be haul- calling in a helicopter. And, you know, and of course, it snowed that night. And, you know, of course, we had missed our re-ration. So, you know, it was it was challenging. Um, but again, like for me, it was this experience of this is real, like, and I have to show up and like, there are very real consequences. And I found that I loved that and that it was, you know, of course, I didn't wish the broken leg on anyone. um, But I found that the sort of real consequences, real show up um, was really powerful and inspiring and like galvanizing for me. 
Wow. So I, I don't know if it was fortunate or unfortunate, but that situation was this aha that prompted you to think, I, I got to do this for a living. I've got to orient my life around this. And so was it a complete 180 from something you were doing in the past? Or how did you take the step into making this like your professional area of focus? Yeah. So I, I basically had like two chapters to my career where I was figuring out the like this. Um, and the first was uh, after I graduated from college and during college, actually during my college summers, uh, training myself and then becoming an outdoor educator. Cause I thought, well, that was such a powerful experience for me. So I want to, you know, educate others and create the opportunity for others to kind of fall in love with place and with that experience so that they can, you know, have that experience go forth in the world. So I did that for about 10 years. And then I pivoted because the leadership piece was really more and more interesting to me. And I also was kind of ready not to be out in the field all the time. <laughs> um, and so I pivoted into uh, environmental nonprofit work with a brief stop in graduate school to kind of facilitate that pivot. And, uh, and really then have been in environmental nonprofits since then with an interest in the content side and impact side of the environment, but also in the um, leadership side of like, how do you organize a bunch of people, your staff, your stakeholders to drive change? I'm, I'm super fascinated by that question. So any anytime I've gone on an adventure, like hiking on a glacier or doing a ropes kind of course, there's always someone there that's just so good at training and so empathetic with how you're going through that. I feel like that's an incredible recruiting grounds for, <laughs> for businesses to find find people, you know, if, if they care as much about business as they do the outdoors. Uh, so you eventually ended up at 1% for the planet. So can you talk a little bit about how you found or how you got this opportunity to join them? Yeah. I mean, I think like most things in my life, it was serendipity and planning. So the planning part is some of what we've talked about. You know, I had a passion. I pursued it. I trained myself and, you know, found opportunities to, you know, implement that work. And so that's the, that's the kind of planning part and like doing the work. But then the serendipity part is, you know, I had been the executive director of another nonprofit um, and I was ready for a change and just started talking to people as, you know, you often do and kind of opening up the world to the world and like putting the, putting the message out there and um, ended up learning that 1% for the planet was an opportunity. Um, and it happened to be very, you know, right across the street from me at that point. Um, and so I was able to you know, make that move um, based on having those conversations and really learning that what I had been working on, that environmental piece, the building partnerships, the thinking about how you organize people to drive change was something that 1% for the planet was looking for as well. So can you give us the quick elevator pitch? I know everybody heard your intro before this started, but what, what is 1% 1% for the planet? What is the mission? We are a global community of business members and individuals, mostly business members who are focused on driving change through implementing a giving commitment to environmental nonprofits every year. So our business members give 1% of their annual sales to environmental nonprofits um, each year. Wow. So anybody that joins as a member is committing to pledge 1% of their sales to any environmental cause that fits with them? Or is, is, are there a bunch of different choices? Yeah. So this is more the like going up the stairs pitch just to share a little bit more. So we, um, we engage the business members and they make that annual commitment and it, it's initially a pledge, but it's actually an annual commitment. Like we certify that this happens every year, which is, super powerful because this is giving that's happening annually. And then we also um, vet and work with nonprofit partners. So the giving needs to go to these approved nonprofit partners. And that's a real value add that we offer because it can be quite challenging to figure out who to give to. What do I, what change do I want to drive? Who are the nonprofits that should receive my money that I feel confident about? Like all of those questions, we help to solve for that. Got it. I've never heard anyone call that the going up the stairs pitch, but I'm <laughs> definitely going to say that in the future. So thank you. So we're going to spend the most of the time talking in this podcast about just how philanthropic 
giving, how, how these types of commitments can help better align your business with your customer base. And it's something that I think, uh, you know, you see sometimes the, the headlines pop up with, you know, certain B corporations or companies that have unique models that have kind of giving built in. But the way that you all approach this, I think, is a very accessible way to build giving into the, the, uh, any business model. So, um, yeah. I guess the first thing I would say is how have you seen in your experience across your membership, the philanthropic giving really just levels up the relationship with someone's customers? It's a really, really great question because customers are, and the data supports this, lots of different data supports this. Customers are really interested in businesses that are using their business to drive change. And so, you know, businesses that are putting solar panels on their warehouses, that are cleaning up their supply chain, all of that is super important and kind of difficult to communicate sometimes. So what we have learned through our, you know, our work with our business members over the last 20 years is that one of the really powerful um, points of giving is that it's, it's a great uh, bridge to com- communicate an environmental commitment to customers. Um, so what customers, what people, because that's really what customers are as people often want. They want data, but they also want and need stories to help them make sense of that data, to help them sort of incorporate it into their kind of understanding. And also people make emotional decisions too. So giving, um, and I want to say more about the power of giving beyond just storytelling, but giving is a really important way in which stories and real authentic communication about an environmental commitment can be kind of in the wheelhouse of any business when they do it. The other thing I do want to say about giving is it's, you know, it's not just a storytelling tool. It's a way that businesses can expand their scope of impact. And that's a, that's pretty fundamental to what we believe at 1% of the planet. So, you know, businesses operate in an environment where they're, um, sort of working within the market, which has a lot of space, but it's still, you know, bounded. They're working within the market to do what they do, to create their product or their service, to create, to generate a profit, to generate resources, to, you know, to, to do business. Nonprofits operate where there isn't a market, where there isn't maybe a market yet, or there may never be a market. And they are operating in order to drive impact and to, you know, plow any resources back into driving positive impact in whatever way their mission directs. So when a business gives to a nonprofit, they're immediately expanding the scope in which they are driving impact. And so, you know, within their business, they may invest in solar panels or clean up their supply chain. And that's awesome. And that's all within the market. And we need every business to do that. And we also need and want businesses to step outside of that space to drive even more change through this nonprofit sector that's operating where there is no market. And as an added bonus, they get the ability to really deepen their connection with customers because of the stories of that on the ground impact. Yeah, one of the things that we've been talking about, I guess, to, to use a sort of an analogy in our product is when people put data into the product, we want to multiply the output of whatever they put in, you know, so they give us a little bit and we seemingly multiply it to create more. And I think that's kind of what giving to a nonprofit from a business looks like is you're multiplying impact by having this whole separate organization that's 100% focused on this other thing, create more than you could with those same resources. Is that, am I saying that well? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, I would just add too that what you're doing too is again, you're taking those resources in the sphere in which you can generate them and saying, we're gonna expand our impact by putting them into this other sphere, other sector. I was gonna say the other thing too that we really believe when you think about it this way, you kind of shift how you think about philanthropy. So a lot of times people hear philanthropy and they think of like, galas or like kind of traditional, sometimes boring um, ways of approaching um, having some money left over at the end of the year and, you know, kind of making that decision game time based on what you have in the bank. What we're saying is, no, 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 build it into your operating model, build it into your strategy, build it into your brand and, and then really think of it differently as not just a nice to have at the end of the year, but as something that's core to how you deliver a good product, good service, relate to your customers, build your whole strategy. And then it becomes, you can then talk about it like, okay, you pay your rent, you pay your employees, and you wouldn't think of not doing those things. You couldn't run a business if you didn't. And you pay 
for the impact that you are having and you pay for creating a thriving future so that businesses and communities can continue to thrive. So it, it become it moves into the center of the operations of the business. Just part of the DNA, part of what we do. So how could a company decide what impact they want to make? I imagine that, you know, when you've got businesses, especially established businesses, you've got a lot of different personalities and a lot of different people. So any tips on how to hone in on what impact we want to make as a business? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And, you know, definitely like put your finger on something that is challenging because I think a lot of times people think, oh, I wish I could give more. And then when they decide to, it, they realize, oh, it's really hard to figure out how to do it in a way that aligns with what I want to do. So that is one of the things that we work with our businesses on is we have, you know, questions that we're able to ask about, you know, do you want to give locally? Do you want the giving to be where your employees are based? Do you want the giving to be where your supply chain is operating? Do you want your, you know, how closely do you want it aligned with your products? Like if you make you know, sandals, do you want it to be ocean focused as a really simple example? So, you know, we have a lot of questions and experience kind of helping businesses to think through what is the that storytelling that they want to leverage? What is that on the ground impact that is most aligned either with their heart? In some cases, it's, a, you know, a founder's like, this really matters to me. I happen to be doing this business, but this is the change I want to drive. More often, there's, you know, there's a way in which it's really aligning with pillars of communication that the, the company has established. That makes sense. And I like those filters of, is it geography? Is it the type of work that we're doing? So mm -hmm. that's, that's a smart way to approach it. Um, I think w one of the things that I'm not sure if I'm going to ask this question in the right way, but when, when you make the commitment to give a percentage of profits or percentage of revenue, and it feels like this thing that you want to have some kind of ROI in the business, how do you decide between over promoting this or, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons? I think what we try and communicate and what we believe is it's not either or it doesn't need to be seen as kind of a trade off. Am I doing this because it, you know, is the right thing to do or am I doing this because it's good for my business? And we believe that the more you can kind of conflate those two, the better you will really lean into um, integrating it into your business. Um, so, you know, for example, we talk openly about like, here's, here are the ways, here's the data on what consumers are looking for. So here's why 1% for the planet can be a really good business decision to make this commitment. And we have, you know, some great examples from business members who have said, yeah, it was like the best financial decision I made. Um, and, you know, here's how I have grown. Um, and others who say like, I totally did it just because it felt like the right thing to do. And I felt kind of guilty that I wasn't doing more. And, it's cool that it's a positive part of my business. So it depends somewhat on who's doing it, but we really encourage people like, you don't have to choose. It can be, it can feel good and be the right thing and it can be good for business. And that's the win-win because that's how we keep doing things. It can also be a great way to attract employees that really care about that thing too, right? Because it's not just for your customers. It's great internal marketing. Like I, I remember working with a business that had this little internal ticker of how much they had donated to this certain cause. And as that went across the million dollar mark or the $2 million mark, it was something that was really celebrated internally. So it's, it's definitely a recruiting advantage, I think too. Absolutely. It's a, that's a really excellent point. It's recruiting advantage and, and, you know, in this day and age, retention advantage. And, you know, we have some really awesome examples from our network. There's one company in particular that comes to mind and they, they do a really great thing, which is super simple, little twist, but it makes a big difference. They talk about their success, not in terms of their sales amount, but in terms of their giving amount, which is the same thing. It's just a percentage of the sales, but they just flip the narrative. And that makes a huge difference because then what you're celebrating as a company in terms of your like KPIs is here's the impact we drove through all the work that we did to generate those increased sales, which is super motivating. And sometimes just talking about the sales numbers may not have, you know, again, sort of like that storytelling with consumers. It's similar. It just you have that that motivation tied to driving change in the world. Yeah. And I, I, I've also seen some companies that put a little twist on it. And instead of talking about the dollars that they've donated or something like that, it's like we've saved enough energy to power, you know, a million light bulbs for a year or something. And you just it's it's this this thing you can't even really comprehend. It just feels big. Yeah, I think that's a great point, because, the you know, the other 
part of the work that we do is with our nonprofit partners. And one of the things we ask them is, you know, how, what are the different ways that you can share the impact that you accomplish as a result of the funding that you receive? Because then, you yeah. know, it can be really powerful to tell those stories about, you know, people served or engaged or trees planted or, you know, all, many different types of metrics, metrics, tons of um, carbon removed from the atmosphere, things like that. So I'm, I've got a tough question for you, and that's, is this something every business should do? Are there exceptions of when you, you know, you, maybe you're too early or you're not profitable or something like that, where you should focus on a sustainable business first? Or is this something everyone should be doing from the beginning? We think that everyone should do it. Um, and here's why, uh, you know, of course, at one level, you know, it's like, of course, I would say that. But but we really do believe that because what we have seen, and this is, you know, so you know, experience from the field is that the, the pre-revenue startup companies that build it in, they build it in. And so it just becomes part of how you operate. So again, in the same way that you don't, you know, you, you consider what you're, what you're going to pay as salaries, but you don't you're, you're going to pay your staff. <laughs> you're, it's not going to occur to you not to pay staff. And in the same way, when you build it in early, it can't, you, it begins to be inconceivable that you wouldn't add this give back that drives powerful impact to create the kind of future that we want to be part of. So, you know, building it in when you start is awesome. Even if you're still like getting to the point of generating revenue or, you know, coming in late, we have many companies join when they're, you know, pr really well established and quite large. And, and it's like, okay, this is something we have to do. We're either a leader in our field or we have the bandwidth now to think about this, or it's just like, we got to do this. So I think, you know, we have companies that come to us through all different pathways and for all different reasons. And there's a lot of power in doing that. And again, really seeing how it, for all of us to create a thriving future for planet and people, which is our purpose. That's why 1% for the planet exists. We need for companies to, um, and consumers with them to see the power of incorporating this way of thinking into the and acting into the into the DNA. So where did one percent come from? What, what's the, what's the idea there? Yeah. So our founder is Yvonne Chenard and his buddy Craig Matthews, who the story goes that they founded it on the banks of the Madison River when they were fishing, and they realized like if we want places like this to sell our products and do our thing, we need to you know, have our companies be part of the solution. That's essentially the founding story. And as part of that, they, you know, landed on 1% as, it's not a magic number, but it's a big number. 1% of sales is a big number. Anyone who's running a business knows that, um, you know, especially in small margin industries, that can be a, you know, a good chunk of your profit. So it's like, it is not nothing. So real number and a attainable number. So not out of reach so that, you know, people just walk away. Um, and you can wrap your head around it. So from a like consumer and business standpoint, like you can wrap your head around 1% as opposed to like 2.3% or, you know, some other random number that could have a basis in data, but you know, that doesn't really work. So for all those reasons, um, and we have many members who give more than that. Um, we, we always certify the 1%, but you know, companies can certainly choose to do more than that and to, to talk about that. Yeah, it's definitely more marketable than 2.3%. Exactly. <laughs> so we did, we did something s similar, but um, I gave 1% of the whole company's equity to fund like youth entrepreneurship programs locally in the geography that we're in. And so, so it's just an, another way of giving back. But uh, I really like the, the, the tangible nature of just 1% of your sales. And it's just something you certify every year. Absolutely. And I think part of that, it's, it's a discipline too. And that's another reason, just back to your question around when should companies adopt it? You know, a company that, um, has this built in, you know, it, it's a, it's an indicator of financial discipline in addition to all the impact that we're talking about. So, you know, I also believe that it sends a really strong signal to potential investors and others that, you know, we're thinking hard and planning hard and like orienting ourselves to, be able to build a business that thrives in the business sector, but also thrives in the impact sector. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, th this is a, a, a tough 
I guess, market, a tough time that we're, we're going through and the environment. I keep seeing headlines about, uh, you know, th- this being such an important time to make some of these decisions. And so I, I can't not ask you about what do, what do businesses need to know on why this is an important thing to invest in right now? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, the headlines and the articles are pretty clear. So we have, you know, a situation in which, you know, climate change impacts and dynamics are accelerating. And so taking action now, you know, a lot of people talk about taking action yesterday, but that's not super motivating. There's not a whole lot we can do about that. We're all about like positive urgency. Um, so, you know, taking action now is is necessary. Um, and part of what 1% for the planet represents is, again, we're not a pledge for future action. We're a pledge for doing work right now. Um, you know, and there are other, you know, the other way we think about it is that the time to invest is now because we want to create and sustain a planet that will be a place that we want to thrive in moving forward. So taking action now to conserve places, to clean up oceans, to make things better, you know, all of that, like we have an opportunity now to make some of those changes so that as, you know, we hopefully continue to move toward a cleaner future, we've we've done the work now to, cr- you know, create the basis for a biodiverse, healthy planet on which we all want to keep thriving. Um, so I think there's a lot of good reasons for acting now, even if, Sometimes people are like, well, but what does this do? I think, you know, this is, I think about the, um, um, what's his name? Uh, General McChrystal. Am I getting his name right? Stanley McChrystal, who has, you know, his views on when people are in combat, you can't, you're going to be paralyzed if you try to try to drive uncertainty down to zero. And I think that's, we're not in combat, but we are in a case where, of course, we want to get good data and good science. But if we keep trying to drive uncertainty down to zero before we act, we're going to miss the opportunity to drive change. So, you know, we're all about saying, hey, yep, there may be some uncertainty that we're still operating in, but it's it's unequivocally better to work toward a cleaner, healthier planet for the species, for people, for everyone. And so get on the board, get on board and start taking action. Get on board. Mm-hmm. I was, so I, I live in the, the Southwest of the U S and Arizona, and I was driving up through, uh, up to Utah and seeing the, the water levels being so low in the lakes. And it's just such an obvious reminder that things have changed over the last couple of decades. And, and, uh, and so I think it's right that we need to do something now about that. And if, and it also just from a human level, I think when we see things like that and, and, you know, I think, probably almost everyone listening can probably point to something, whether it's water levels, floods, fires, you know, it's kind of apocalyptic uh, experiences um, in some ways. And it's hard to, to not know what to do. And that's one of the things that we really believe is also powerful, powerful about 1% for the planet is like, is 1% going to save the world? No. But is 1% the way that we can say, hey, I'm going to do my 1%, you're going to do your 1%, I'm going to try and buy 1% products, I'm going to try and drive more impacts. And that's how we create a global movement. And so we do think about, um, you know, the the specific dollar impact that we're driving. That's what we measure is the number of dollars we're getting out to environmental nonprofits, which, by the way, this year we're at about 60 million in certified giving. Um, and you know, that's an annual certification. So this is real numbers. Um, we also think about the global awareness and movement because that's the other thing we see is consumers who start to be aware of these products. They buy more that drives more impact and it always sparks other changes. And we see that within our business network too. There's almost not a single business that's just doing 1%. Once they get in the network, it's part of a journey. So they're doing their 1%, but they're also learning you know, there's a lot of positive peer pressure to, you know, what's your packaging? How much plastic you got there? What's your, you know, what does your supply chain look like? Hey, did you, how, how did you solve for this? We see so much of that, like positive change. So, you know, it's a, an inspiration for further action. So to the skeptics who are not wanting to give philanthropically, you mentioned at the beginning that there is even data that supports that customers buy more from companies that have this sort of mission. Any any facts that you would share with, with anybody listening to get them over the edge? 
Sure. We love the skeptics. And I will, you know, say, you know, right up front that it's more correlation than causation. You know, it's hard to, you know, distill out what one factor drives, but we have a good example from one of our members, Finlandia Vodka, and they um, did an activation with our, with their 1% commitment in a couple of markets. And this was in, they have, you know, a bunch of different markets on the East Coast and they were doing an activation with point of sale, really clear information about the fact that 1% of sales of their vodka was going back to um, oyster restoration projects to clean the bay. So this was in New York Harbor and um, the Chesapeake Bay that they were sort of activating around this. And they, you know, had some great like, you know, bar top um, examples. So people could be like eating raw oysters and drinking vodka and like see this direct connection. In other markets where people were doing the same thing, eating raw oysters and drinking their vodka, they did not have this activation. It just so happens. And in at the end of the year, in those markets where they were activating, they saw a 7% increase in sales. In the markets where they were not activating, they saw a 2% decrease. Again, correlation, not causation, but we did have this sort of market to market comparison, which, you know, was that some good data. There it is. Kate has guaranteed 7% increase in sales. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I think, <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's obvious, you know, when you can tell a story like that and make a connection, then when the consumer is faced with that choice and this one has a reason, you're going to pick the one with the reason instead of just the, the prettier label, I guess, and uh, which would be maybe my default way of choosing a vodka. And yes, I agree. Um, and the, the reason too, I mean, another word for reason or a, a, um, an equivalent word is uh, purpose. And there is also good like macro data on purpose driven companies outperforming the general market. And that's been true even in recessions. So I think that's, you know, for the skeptics out there, I encourage you to do a little research on that because there is some good, again, macro data looking at, you know, a purpose-driven companies, um, you know, as a whole and how they perform relative to the market as a whole. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So this marks, I think the 20 year anniversary of 1% for the planet. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. 20 years. And so as you think back, you know, from, from as long as you've been there or when it first started, do you feel like uh, the mission is the same from the very beginning as it is today or has it evolved? You know, the mission is, is really pretty, has been very durable. It's pretty much the same. The world has changed a lot. So we just in doing some research for ourselves, it's just like, what, what, like, let's remember what it was like in 2020 or in 20, in 2002. So just as like reference, uh, Facebook didn't exist yet. iPhone had not been launched yet. Um, so, you know, I'll just leave those two. Like, that's pretty significant. The internet was a totally different beast then. I mean, it was much different. And so, you know, the conditions and the, um, you know, the actual operations of figuring out nonprofits was very different. And so we've had to evolve how we communicate and how we um, provide information. And and there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity in that. And there's also, you know, some different, you know, it's it's easier to search for a nonprofit now, but can you vet that nonprofit and understand that nonprofit? So, you know, we've definitely had to um, evolve in really great ways, but our mission has really stayed the same, which is to build this movement of companies who are sort of making it core to their operations that they drive impact through giving. And so what's next for, for you and the team and the yeah. organization? Yeah. And I mean, never a dull moment. We maybe uh, have a durable mission, but we're always thinking about it. Our question is, how do we drive more impact faster? So the beauty of 1% is that it's incremental in that, you know, you can do your 1%, I can do my 1%. It all adds up and we kind of create this kind of growing um, movement of 1% um, giving, but it's always 1% by 1%. So we've been thinking about like, how can we like make that exponential, like up that curve? So one of the things, you know, we've doubled down on just growing our member network. So, so we have seen really significant growth over the last couple of years and, and we've, we're psyched to see that we're having more businesses join. We're having more bigger businesses join. So that's like a bigger 1%. So that's awesome. We also have launched, uh, for the first time, a new program, which is called our Planet Impact Fund. And it's in partnership with the National Philanthropic Trust and CapShift and 
basically what it is, is it's a way that any donor, so member or non-member, can give to this fund. And it's um, comparable to a donor advised fund, for those of you who are familiar with that. If you're not, the way it works is you give to this fund. It's a charitable donation. When you make the donation, it drops into an uh, investment pool, and those dollars are invested for impact. And that's where CapShift is our investment advisor and does that work. And then, um, so those dollars grow as they drive impact. And then annually, we give um, at least 10% to nonprofits from that fund. So what we're doing is we're creating this way in which we're leveraging philanthropy, environmental philanthropy. That's what we're good at. That's what we know. But now we're adding in this way that members and non-members can grow this fund and we can drive impact at the investment level through initially public. And then as we grow, we'll do private investments as well, because that's where we can really up the impact on that side. And this is all with philanthropic dollars. And then we will also give to nonprofits because we have a commitment to and a belief in the need for annual uh, impact on the ground through nonprofits. So the Planet Impact Fund is a really exciting way that we think we can kind of accelerate and create that exponential curve in terms of impact and um, giving. Well, thank you for everything that you're doing. You know, whenever I talk to someone like you that's in this space, uh, I just feel like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> you know, and I think that uh, particularly 1% for the planet is a nice bridge between what corporations are doing in their spaces to be able to still make an impact and know that we're, we're making a, a leaving behind a better planet than we inherited. So I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Uh, any final lesson or takeaway that you want to make sure everyone listening leaves with? I guess I would say two things. One, just to your last point. I mean, I think the, the power of 1% is that wherever you're sitting um, in whatever business you're in, and, you know, we, the, we need our businesses to provide a lot of the, you know, products and services that keep us going. So wherever you're sitting, though, you can be part of this movement. So to your point, you really can be driving impact no matter what your business is, and that's powerful. And then the other thing that I would um, just encourage people to do is to, you know, think through that. We, you know, we really invite you to consider how would you want to be involved? What is the 1% step you want to take? Because it's there for you, and we would love to talk to you. And where can people get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more? Super easy. 1%fortheplanet.org, all spelled out. Um, personally, I'm on LinkedIn, so I invite people to connect with me there. I love talking to and connecting with people on LinkedIn. So just Kate Williams, 1% of the planet, you'll find me. Um, and we have a very simple join form on our website. If you, you'll, you'll see it at the top of the page and you can click through and take action immediately and, you know, get into conversation with my awesome team about, um, about how to become a member. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Kate Williams, everyone. It's such a cool cause, such a great concept, so approachable for businesses that want to make an impact with whatever you're doing. And like Kate said, anything, whatever industry that you're in, customers do want to make a difference. And businesses, our businesses are one of the ways that they can make a difference. Shopping with a business that they know has some environmental impact or other impact is one of the ways that customers can spend their dollars and can direct their dollars toward the things that they care about. So if you're looking to stand out, if you want to add some uh, incentive for customers to purchase with you, this is one way to do it. Uh, I encourage you to go over to 1% for the planet, learn more and, uh, and definitely do something because whether it's this or some other cause, now is the time to act. So Kate, thank you again so much for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for listening to Organized Chaos. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, or share it with anyone in your network that you think could benefit from this information. For episode show notes, podcast recaps, and tons of other small business news and inspiration, check out the manual. That's trainual.com backslash manual.